and to look at this thing that is that only exists as a social construct in our minds. <laughs> Otherwise, it has nothing, and yet it so permeates everything that we do. Um, we tend to look at it as being human nature, which is a lie, um, because it changes and it's changed over time, depending upon how we wanted to explore. So I'm here going to talk about um, there was a common definition for one, one thing. Um, <clears throat> I teach uh, a course in social justice and equity on the master's level and also on the doctoral level. And I'm very pleased that our graduate school has a master's program, a master of arts and education, that has required courses in social justice, required course in uh, public policy, required course in action research. Uh, and this is probably the only program in the country that has these as basic requirements. Um, the, the philosopher Hannah Arendt, uh, and this is a, I'll give you some examples of how I teach as a way of, of, of these examples, uh, working with young adults. Um, Hannah, the philosopher Hannah Arendt made the point once that, um, that other people may tell your story about what you did, what you accomplished, what did you produce, but only you tell the story of who you are. And I think uh, this is the influence that Jean Piaget has had on me. The developmental point of view is very important. So a lot of the work I do begins in early childhood. I'm interested in uh, with us going together, when taking the issue of race. When, when are, what are your first stories about being a witness to racism? First stories about being a victim? First stories about being a perpetrator? First stories about being an ally, and how does this connect to your own life? Um, so uh, the, the notion of narrative and story, very quickly, uh, I was born in 1949 in Alexandria, Louisiana, uh, in a very segregated place. From the age of eight, my parents knew that they were going to become missionaries for the Presbyterian Church. And the choices we had at the time were the Congo, uh, Brazil, Korea, and Japan. Uh, my parents finished seminary at age 12, I moved to Japan, and then to Hiroshima, and lived in Hiroshima, Japan. My family lived there for the next 30 years. Um, years later, after going to college and graduate school, I came back and was the headmaster of that school, uh, the International School of Peace in Hiroshima, which is a very interesting place to think about, first of all, what it means to be an American. <laughs> it's another place to think about what does it mean to be human. What does it mean to be, uh, what does it mean, to, uh, often I suggest that, that what might be helpful for all of us sometimes is to, to get away from the planet and go sit on the moon and look back and do what astronauts do. Uh, they, they go around the planet and they see no political boundaries. They see a notion of being interconnected. And then they begin to tell their life stories and they see their life story is full of, of separation, of difference of uh, what Eric Erickson called pseudo-speciation. The only living species that makes judgments about inferiority or, in, or superiority while we're the same living species. So, so what's that about? Is it a mate? Mm -hmm. Is it cultural? Mm -hmm. Is it accommodated? What is it? What is it about that? So, that's, so that, you know, part of the work I do is working with my own life story like I expect everyone that I work with to do. Because that's what we own, and that's the only thing that, you know, taking a course with me is not going to change your mind unless you change your mind. Mm -hmm. So that's how I work. And I just want to say that I've been a teacher, I've been teaching for 40 years this year. Um, <laughs>
dealing with the social constructions, the reality that uh, embed and trap our consciousness on a daily basis, or relative to other dimensions of self, the cultural, spiritual dimension, the political uh, dimension, what have you. The bottom line is social justice is really ultimately about how we uplift ourselves and our planet and how we can aspire to have a deeper reverence for humanity. With that, I'd like to ask the panel if they have other thoughts relative to the definition of social justice. Thank you. Uh, I would approach it as follows. It's obvious I'm an African American male and I did grow up in a segregated community. And just for those of you who heard that term, that means that in the community I grew up in, there were no whites at all. We didn't go in the white community, they didn't come in the black community. I graduated from high school in Nashville, Tennessee in 1968. And my first interaction with anyone in white was at Vanderbilt University when I won the science fair and went to the National Science Fair to represent the state of Tennessee. Um, my interest is among it, is, it really deals with the major demographic group in the U.S., African-American black males, which experience the poorest educational outcomes. And I think when we get to the heart of that matter, we will probably get to the, one of the most crucial <coughs> issues that we face in terms of the outcome of social justice. We have a lot of symbols that are out there. But if you define the problem, then the solution to the problem will give you the ultimate, and that is you have either achieved the social justice you set out to, to achieve, or your hypothesis was probably not correct. Well, the measuring the outcomes in terms of test scores, high school graduation, post-secondary attendance, or college graduation, African-American males lag substantially behind other groups. It is widely recognized that unequal education outcomes lead to unequal economic consequences throughout the life course. In particular, individuals with low attainment and poor quality education, these often overlap, can expect to face an inferior employment prospects, low wages, poor health, great environment in the criminal justice system. I've taken, I read to you directly from a major study that was done, uh, early childhood research piece that was done, uh, and it was done by Henry Levin, PhD at Columbia University, Lee Belfield, PhD at the University of New York, Peter Muin, MD, Columbia University, Cecilia Rouse, uh, PhD, Princeton University, Barbara Wolf, University of Madison, Wisconsin, and, and Nathan Tepp, University of Wisconsin. We're fortunate to have in the 8th in the, uh, Federal Reserve District, Art Rolnick, who's done an awful lot of research on the economic payback and return on investment if we were to eliminate this problem. Social justice major, ma major measurement on a worldwide basis in terms of outcomes or the quality of life we expect will be determined on how this issue is resolved within the fabric of our society. Um, just to cut through the chase, if we were just to equal the dropout rate between white males and black males, the United States would save about $3.9 billion. If we were to increase it among all gender and race and creed in America, it would be over $10 billion annually. Uh, so it's a social justice issue. Why? Because when we go back to the beginning of the issue of integration, separate but equal, we can trace the origin from slavery down to the present day of the African American who, American who has a new plight and a new life within the culture to that of drugs on the street. We can make the correlations between those who create the drugs, manufacture the drugs, and then those who have the law enforcement responsibilities. And, and what, what we're caught is we're caught in a huge dilemma. And that dilemma is where, what is the best way that we might, that we might address this problem? Uh, I come from a background that education is, is probably the answer, most likely. Education was not an option when I grew up. Education is the, is the direction, 